Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm Sarah Goodwin. I'm the executive director of the Science Communication Lab. We are a nonprofit uh, that has been around since 2006. Um, we became a we were a project then in 2006. We became a nonprofit in 2014, and I joined in 2011. And so I've been um, working with this organization for the last 10 years. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about like what we've been up to, kind of things that we've done that we are changing, why we're changing them, and a little bit about my path into science communication. All right, and then it's not letting, there we go. Okay, so just for an overview of the Science Communication Lab, the Science Communication Lab is made out of three different initiatives. Um, so I just wanna mention, you know, as Dominique said, the Science Communication Lab is a bit of a new name for us. We originally were iBiology, um, which we're now calling one of our initiatives. We kind of had these different initiatives popping up and felt like we needed an umbrella to kind of cover everything. And we felt like the Science Communication Lab kind of covered, caught, caught, captured the spirit of what we're trying to do with everything we do. But just to kind of give an overview of our, of our different initiatives, so iBiology is really the foundation of the Science Communication Lab. It's what started all of this back in 2006, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about its origins. But the goal of iBiology has always been to tell um, research stories about science and, and stories about kind of scientific culture and other aspects of, of the scientific community. Um, and the audience has been the scientific and educational communities, um, although that's really, that's been shifting a little bit in the last couple of years, which I'll talk about. Um, in, a, in later in the talk, but um, iBiology, the goal for iBiology has always been to highlight the science and to really dive deep into the science and kind of give a window into the scientific process. And we also create courses for graduate students and postdocs on how to do science um, and how to communicate science. Um, so that's kind of another initiative in iBiology. So the Wonder Collaborative was started in 2015 and it was really to kind of expand what we were doing to reach the general public. And so that includes uh, documentaries like Human Nature, which I'll talk about later in the talk as well, um, and also short films. Um, but really, we want to capture the wonder and awe of science in the content that we're creating and really reach a very broad audience. And then Explorer's Guide to Biology is a recent initiative that's really aimed at uh, creating written content to be used in undergraduate classrooms to kind of bring the, the you know, science research um, told in a different way than you find in textbooks. Uh, into the classroom as a free resource. And I'm not gonna talk about Explorer's Guide but um, today, but I will say that each of these initiatives has their own website where you can dive deeper into the content that we've made for each of them. Okay, so quickly on how I, how I got into this. So um, I consider myself a scientist. Uh, I have always loved science. Um, I loved learning about science. I loved teaching science. Um, and I decided to pursue a PhD in science research. Uh, so I found myself, I'm from the East Coast, but I found myself uh, going to California to go to graduate school at UC San Francisco. Um, and I joined the lab of a scientist um, named Ron Vale, who's pictured uh, in the picture of, you know, the graduation picture, I think it's on the right or the left. I don't, I never know with presentations, which side is which. So, um, and I'll, I'm going to come back to Ron in a second, but, um, you know, I actually really loved doing research. I was in a cell biology lab, um, which really appealed. Like I've loved, I always love visualizing things. Like I've done a lot of photography and cell biology just appealed to that part of me. Cause you're always, you know, you get to look through microscopes, you make, got to make beautiful pictures. Um, I spent many, many hours, you know, doing that. And I actually really enjoyed it. And, when I graduated, I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. You know, I had had a good research experience, um, but I wasn't really sure I wanted to end up doing, you know, lab research at a major institution. Um, I had done a lot of teaching while I was in graduate school and really enjoyed that. And I felt like, you know, I also went to a small liberal arts college and loved kind of that educational nature. So I was kind of thinking like, well, maybe I'll go do a postdoc with the goal of ending up at a small liberal arts college. So that's kind of where I was when I was graduating. I um, had agreed to do a postdoc and that was kind of my end goal. Um, and then Ron, uh, meanwhile, had started this project, iBiology, and I'll explain why he started it in a second. Um, but he had just gotten a grant to hire someone to run the project uh, right when I graduated. And because of my interest in science education and communication, he asked me to run it for a year. Um, which I agreed to do. And uh, at the end of the year, I kind of did a lot of soul searching and decided that I wanted to continue on and um, continue on this path of running a science communication education organization. And, you know, 10 years later, I'm still here. Um, so, uh, and I can talk more about that if people are interested in kind of what made me decide to do that. But back to Ron. So Ron, Ron is a really amazing 
individual. Like he is a great scientist, but he also is always looking, you know, within the scientific community at needs that are there, that he feels like are like needs that are there or problems that are there and trying to figure out ways to solve it. And so the problem that he was looking at um, when I was a graduate student was the problem of like disseminating not scientific knowledge through seminars. Um, so most people, uh, to be able to hear a scientific talk by an individual, either that person, you know, comes to their university in a seminar series similar to this one, or maybe they speak at a conference. Um, but, you know, most people can only go to a certain number of, uh, go to give talks at a certain number of institutions each year. Conferences are expensive to go to. Um, that's only also focusing kind of on the, the U.S., like international travel is, you know, even harder. And so Ron, um, back in 2005, 2006, was kind of thinking, you know, he only had so much time to go to talks. Like, is there another way that we could disseminate, you know, scientific seminars where people really learn about a lot about the scientific process um, in a way that was more, like, equitable? So anyone could see a seminar by a particular scientist. And so Ron raised money to start this initiative called iBiology. And um, so just to set the scene in 2005, like YouTube was founded in 2005. Netflix started putting content on their video content online in 2007. Coursera, which is known as, you know, this major educational online course platform didn't start till 2012. So 2005 was really early on in the world of putting videos online um, for people to view. And so I feel like, you know, this was really an idea Ron came up with that was really, you know, novel at the time. And he decided that not only would he, um, you know, he didn't want to record people giving talks from the back of a lecture hall. He actually came up with this idea to record people in a green screen studio, um, which you can see pictured there. Um, so it's kind of like the weatherman. The scientists would be in front of a green screen. They'd have a monitor on one side, a monitor in front of them so they could point to different places on their slide. And it kind of created like a new way to view science content. And this is Cristela Jones Prather, who's a scientist at MIT. Um, and we we started recording these talks um, and putting them online uh, for free, basically. So anyone could see a talk by any scientist. And the talks were custom made for iBiology. So we had the scientist um, or the speaker make their, you know, make slides uh, that kind of covered a general overview of their field, dived into research stories, and we worked with them to kind of make their slides fit the format. Um, but that was that was the goal of 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 this project. And the major questions we were asking were, like, can we like democratize science knowledge by putting talks online for free? So kind of the, the original mission of this whole thing was to do that. Um, and then, you know, the other question was like, is there a need in the community for these types of talks? Like we could, you know, this was something that Ron felt like would fill a need, but, you know, we were yet to see if that was really the case. And what I was really interested in when I joined, um, so I was a graduate student when we started this, I participated in the project in a few different ways while I was in graduate school, but in 2011, when I really started working full time on it, what I was really interested in were um, can talks by scientists about their research show the process of science in educational classrooms, you know, is it a new way to kind of show how science is done instead of, you know, the way that a lot of people learn about science in undergraduate classrooms, especially is kind of through memorization. And so, you know, we have actually not changed the format for the most part of what we've done at iBiology for almost 10 years. And we've only recently started to experiment in what we do. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But um, just to kind of, you know, go through what 10 years of iBiology has looked like, you know, we've created a lot of content. Um, so we have over a thousand videos uh, on our website that cover a wide range of fields of science. Um, we have, you know, we dive into techniques, like we have a really popular microscopy course. And, um, you know, for all intent and purposes, this series or this project is a real success, you know, just even by measuring um, viewership, if you want to use that as a metric. Um, so we started putting we the videos kind of on our custom uh, video player on our website. But in 2009, we started putting them on YouTube, which let us get better analytics. And so even just since 2009, um, we've had over 17 million views of our content. Um, in 2012, YouTube started having a metric called minutes watched, which allowed you to really measure how long someone was watching content for, as opposed to views can just be someone clicks in and out. And um, so in the last 10 years, people have watched the equivalent of 168 years worth of science content. Um, and this is really like deep science content. It's very, you know, very focused on the research and, and kind of really dive deep into research stories. And we found, um, although we haven't like figured out a way to really measure this in a formal way. But um, just through talking to a lot of people and anecdotes and surveys that we've done, 
Um, these talks are really used widely in, in formal and informal educational settings. So, you know, for all reasons like this has been a real success, but a few years ago, we started to really kind of wonder if there was another way that we could capture what we were trying to do with iBiology um, in, in a different way. So some of the challenges of this approach that we had been having were that, you know, scientists were volunteering their time for this project and they had to put in a lot of effort. So not only did they have to design, you know, their slides and usually make up a new talk, but they also had to travel to one of our green screen studios to be recorded. So it's a huge burden on the speaker. And um, the other challenge was like, we had a lot of content, like we had a thousand videos, you know, it's just a lot of content to, to organize and, you know, make sense of. And also it felt like, well, should we just be adding to that content? Like there's certainly more science fields we could cover, but at what point are you just kind of, have you done, have you done what you were there to do and, you know, just adding more maybe wouldn't be as impactful. Um, and the other challenge of this was that we actually had no control over what the speaker said because they're giving their own talk. And so, you know, we get a speaker into the studio and, you know, we ask them to aim their talk for a certain level of audience, but every speaker, you know, has a different approach to that. And so, you know, it was challenging for us uh, because, you know, our content really kind of spanned a lot of levels, like from, you know, a talk that maybe would be good for an introductory audience um, or an undergraduate biology audience all the way up to like, you know, maybe like a specialized person in that field could understand the talk, but no one else could. And that was hard because we, you know, we really wanted to create content that anyone could watch, um, you know, who are interested in that science topic. And, you know, we just didn't have a lot of control over that. So we started to think about different approaches to communicating science. And I'm going to take a step to the side because something else that happened in 2015 was I was joined by my colleague, Elliot Kirshner, who runs the science communication lab with me. And he's on the very top of the picture of all of us on the stairs. Um, some of you might have heard him talk a few years ago in this series. Um, but so Elliot, uh, Elliot grew up around science, but he's not a scientist. Um, but he comes from the world of journalism and documentary film. And he really felt like there was a huge gap in how science was being communicated to the public. So he felt like science was being dumbed down. They weren't capturing the real essence of science, you know, like the excitement of science and the excitement of scientists. And he really wanted to find a way to bring science to the general public in a unique way. Oh, can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Maybe repeat what you just said in like the last 30 seconds. Yes. <laughs> okay. Did I cut out? I want to make sure it's not my microphone. Yeah, I but it's okay. okay. It might have been me. Okay. Well, let me know if that happens again. Um, so I was joined by my colleague, Elliot Kirshner, uh, who runs the science communication lab with me. And so Elliot comes from the world of journalism and documentary film. Um, he's worked with journalist Dan Rather for a very long time, um, but he really saw this gap in how science was being communicated to the public. He felt like it was dumbed down. It wasn't capturing kind of the excitement of science or the wonder of science or how science really works. And he really wanted to find a way to bring science to the general public um, in, in new ways. And so he came and started working with our organization um, and, you know, wanted to find, to find ways to do that. And he started getting involved in some of our projects. Um, and I'm just going to mention one of them, which is uh, this course, these courses that we were making for graduate students and postdocs on how to science. And the reason I bring this one up is when Elliot joined, we had just gotten a grant to do this work. Uh, and we wanted, our first course was on how to ask a scientific question, which is a very complicated thing to cover. It's a very complicated topic to teach. And we were thinking we would do these green screen talks because that's what we had been doing. Um, but Elliot really challenged us on that. He said, well, wouldn't it be better if you had a lot of different voices uh, contributing to this, you know, to a question of like, what's a hypothesis? Like, you know, scientists will answer that in all sorts of different ways. And you can get scientists, um, you know, from different fields, from different career stages, all answering the same question. And so we kind of flipped our approach and started interviewing people um, instead of having them give lectures. So we could kind of control the questions that we were asking them and try to weave together, you know, a lot of different voices on a particular topic. And I'm not going to talk more about the courses, but I think that approach was a real success. And we started using that approach and what we were doing of other things we were doing in iBiology. But just to go back to um, some of the things that we started to really ask were, you know, could we bring the, once Elliot joined, 
Can we really bring the elements of production to tell complex science stories? So by that, I mean working with professional editors who really know how to weave together a complicated story, working with professional animators who, you know, they're, they are just experts in visualization and, and, you know, can really help visualize some of the science that's harder to explain in words. And he also wanted to really ask, could we start capturing more of the wonder and awe of science and what we were doing? And um, the last thing he really wanted to challenge um, and that we always have wanted to challenge is can we, you know, who is the audience for science? Um, and I'll talk about this in the context of our documentary, but a lot of people think science is a very niche topic and, you know, there's only a small audience interested in it. And we really don't believe that. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But so we started experimenting um, in how we did these talks for iBiology that really dove into the research. Um, so the goal was still to convey the research, but we flipped what we were doing and started interviewing people instead of having them prepare talks. And um, the benefit of that was we could just ask a speaker to show up. So we asked them to show up for like a two to three hour interview. So not a small amount of time, but they didn't have to prepare anything ahead of time. And we, you know, the staff at the Science Communication Lab then put in the work to figure out the questions we wanted to ask to figure out um, the story, you know, the parts of the story we really wanted to cover or where we wanted to dive deep into something. You know, if we asked a question and they, you know, the speaker answered in a complex way, we could break that down and follow up questions. And um, we found that this approach worked really, really well. Um, and not only was it, you know, better for us in a way because we could really shape the story, but by interviewing the scientists, we felt like we really were able to capture their personality much better than when they were kind of in lecture mode. Like instead, they're really just responding, you know, to a question prompts and you really got much more of the essence of them. Um, am I still cutting in and out? A little bit, but I, I think it's okay. Okay, I can, I can switch maybe to my computer and uh, maybe that would be better for it. Okay. Should let me take a second and do that. Hold on one second. Yeah, if it's an easy switch, otherwise it's, it's not too bad. Oops. Okay. Let me stop the share for one second. Okay, now I'm back. Let me share my screen again. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it sounds better. <laughs> okay, great. I'm so sorry about that. All right, let me share my screen again. Okay, back back to business, I think. Okay, awesome. great. I'm sounds sorry. good. Okay, so... Um, so yeah, we started interviewing speakers and uh, yeah, so I, not only were we able to kind of shape the story better, but we also were able um, to capture more of the speakers kind of, I don't know, the essence of the speaker, I guess you could put it that way. And so, you know, one example I just want to give is, you know, we recorded right before the pandemic started, actually Matt Messelson and Frank Stahl, who are two scientists who uh, proposed a model for DNA replication in this really kind of like major experiment that is taught in all sorts of classrooms. And, you know, we were able to interview the two of them together and you just get to sense their, their collaboration and their camaraderie. And it was just like a really, I think a special thing to be able to capture that in film and then kind of be able to show that, but also dive into their experiment. And as I mentioned, you know, we were able to start working with animators um, and really bring in the elements of animation and illustration into our work, which you can see on the bottom panels um, as well. Okay, good. Just want to make sure it's still going well. And so we're really starting to experiment more in how we're doing these videos. So we're moving away from the green screen and really taking this new approach to interviewing scientists and weaving together a story in a way that we hope makes for a, you know, a compelling content that appeals to the scientific audience, but also hopefully reaches a broader audience as well. And this is also letting us do some actual like experiments and evaluation of our work. So we've had such a major body of work right now that there's some cases where um, we have a lecture, a whiteboard, and then this interview style uh, video that cover the same exact content. So in this case, we have a green screen lecture by Matt Messelson. We have a whiteboard of the experiment, and then we have the interview that I talked about with Matt Messelson and Frank Stahl. 
And similarly, we have a green screen recording of Jennifer Doudna talking about her um, CRISPR experiment from 2011, a whiteboard about it. And then um, we cut together footage from uh, the documentary Human Nature uh, that was more inter you know, interview-based and have a video of Jennifer Doudna, Manuel Charpentier, and um, Martin Yannick, who's a postdoc in Jennifer's lab. Um, and now we can say like, well, you know, especially in this case in an educational setting, but maybe even broad, more broadly, like what are people getting out of all these different types of science content? You know, they're all done in slightly different ways. They're covering the same topic, but like, what are, you know, what are the learning goal gains? Like what, what about the story or the production is appealing or not appealing? And so we're starting to really kind of dive into that evaluation. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears to human nature. Um, so human nature, um, so as I mentioned, you know, when Elliot joined us in 2015, he really wanted to reach a general public um, with science stories. And uh, in 2015, we started to kind of think about, well, what would be our first project for that? And, you know, I came from, you know, the cell biology lab in 2011. I graduated in 2011, which is right when Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier's uh, CRISPR paper came out. And I just remember, you know, like over the ensuing years, my friends who are still doing research just started using CRISPR more and more and more to the point where in 2014, like so many people I knew were using CRISPR. Like it was clearly having this huge change in how research was done. And at the same time, around 2014 or 15, we did an interview with Jennifer Doudna and she was talking about this kind of like, you know, weird feeling where she was working on this really groundbreaking technology but um, she went to like a PTA meeting for her son and like no one knew about CRISPR there. You know, it was just like really the scientific community knew about it, but the outside world didn't. And we started to think about whether we could do a documentary about CRISPR. I mean, originally we were thinking we would just do a short kind of explainer about what CRISPR was for the general public. But as we talked to scientists and really kind of realized how they were grappling with all the societal and ethical implications of a technology of CRISPR, especially in terms of editing humans, um, we decided to do a documentary that really kind of covered gene editing, covered the dis CRISPR discovery story, which is a great basic research discovery story, um, and, you know, really to create a film that showed kind of all the different aspects of genetic engineering or editing that someone might want to consider um, after what, you know, and, and to something that could spark conversation after watching a film. So just to you know, like the goals of the film of human nature were like to not shy away from the science, to really explain CRISPR, how it was discovered and how it works. Um, and I have a, a, a image there just showing kind of like some of the tools we use to visualize CRISPR. Like that was a big challenge. Like how do you visualize something that isn't visible by the human eye? So we had to come up with kind of a visual language for that. Um, but also like how, you know, could we make a film that also really was nuanced and how um, people were thinking about CRISPR, how it was being talked about in the community, the different ways CRISPR could be used um, in a way that we could create a, you know, a film that by the end of it, you know, someone would want to go have a conversation with their colleague about it. You know, that was kind of what we were hoping for for the film. And it came out in 2019 and by all, you know, by metrics that are commonly used for determining how well a film does, I think it did very well. Like it was released um, at the South by Southwest Film Festival. We have three Emmy nominations, including Best uh, Science Documentary. We've been, you know, award finalists. Uh, we got reviewed very well in the New York Times um, and Vanity Fair and LA Times and all these kind of uh, trade journals. Um, and Human Nature is on Netflix and also on Nova. So by all of those metrics, the film was really successful. Um, the one thing we weren't able to do was uh, it was supposed to come out in theaters mid-March 2020, which is right when the pandemic started. And so uh, we did have a goal of trying to see if a science film that was really science focused could bring people into the theater, but we weren't able to be able to do that part of the experiment, but maybe we'll be able to do that with another film. Um, but all this is to say, like, you know, human nature was successful in that way, but we really wanted to, like, you know, people are always asking, like, what's the impact of your film? What, you know, what's the impact of the stuff that you're doing? And we just didn't feel like these, the, while these things are really great, um, and especially great for getting funding, um, they don't really tell you much else about the impact that your film is having. And so um, we teamed up uh, with Dietram and Emily Howell to kind of, you know, try to better understand the impact human nature was having with different audiences. And so we decided to start this collaboration, you know, after human nature was already made. Um, so we were able to kind of do some surveys with certain screening audiences to try to understand how human nature changed their perception of gene editing, like both their own personal views, but also, 
you know, what they thought the public would think of gene editing um, and, you know, different elements that they liked or didn't like about the film. And we're still analyzing that. Um, but then we decided we really kind of wanted to take things one step further and see if we could break down elements of human nature um, that, you know, could tell us something more about science communication through film. And so um, along with Amanda Mulder, we've started uh, this uh, project that we're on the second year of, of really trying to piece, to kind of tease apart different elements of science storytelling. And right now we're focusing on, like, if you have a narrator in front of a piece of science content, does it matter what the gender or the race of the narrator is? Um, but we're really trying to tease apart um, in what we're doing now and, and grants that we've submitted to tease apart different elements of science storytelling, um, especially the visual, you know, visual ones, and how that can affect people's trust in science, you know, people's uh, understanding of science, like how they view stuff that they watch afterward, their engagement with content. Um, we're also, you know, we also have a grant in with uh, Dominique and Todd Newman as well to try to understand the role of uncertainty in science. But all this is to say that, you know, these research practice partnerships, as, you know, people call them, have been, you know, they're, we think they're just so important. Like, it's been a real eye-opening to be able to work with um, Dietram and his group to try to really figure out ways to further the knowledge of science communication and the field of science communication through the work that we're trying to do. And, like, I think it's been, you know, these past couple of years really trying to tease apart, like, the goals that we have and the goals, um, you know, of the research of science communication and how can we bring that together to really, you know, learn something um, and, you know, affect what we do has been really exciting and interesting and challenging. And so that's kind of an area that we're really focused on, you know, expanding in and, and really trying to evaluate what we do in a real like rigorous way, um, which we hadn't really done until, you know, three or four years ago. So I just want to end uh, with just a little bit about what we're doing next. So um, we have some documentaries in pre-production. We worked on another documentary called Picture Scientist, which was released uh, in 2020 and also had a social science study to try to understand its impact as well. Um, but that's, I think, going to be an element of every, all the documentaries that we do. And um, we're trying to kind of also push the envelope in short films. So beyond kind of the way of interviewing scientists and diving into the research um, stories, we're trying to kind of show science in different ways. So the two most recent films we released, one was focused on kind of a, a sense of what a redwood forest is like after uh, one of the fires in California in 2020. Um, so there's a little bit of science in there, but really we are trying to kind of show science in a different way. And uh, the other film, Finding Faith in Science, was um, actually used footage from human nature that we didn't use in the film. Um, but it features uh, uh, Dr. Tashaka Cunningham, who is a scientist, but also a deacon. And he does a lot of work in church communities to try to get those communities engaged in gene editing um, and teach them about gene editing and kind of inform them so they can better participate in conversations around this technology. Um, so that is what that film is about. Um, we're, we have another course coming out for mentees on mentorship, then we have more written narratives coming out. And so what we've kind of felt like at the Science Communication Lab is like, you know, we do a lot of production and that's mostly what I've talked about today, but we also feel like distribution and then research and evaluation are equally as important and those are areas we're trying to grow a lot. Um, so distribution, like, you know, I think those questions of like, who is the real audience for science content is something that we are continually asking. You know, when we did Human Nature, uh, we got some responses from funders who said that there's no way people are going to come see a film about CRISPR and gene editing. Like, you don't have a protagonist, you don't have a narrator, like, we just don't think it's going to work. And, um, you know, we feel like we proved them wrong. Uh, maybe they don't think we proved them wrong, but, you know, we really believe that, like, there are, that people are more interested in science than, than conventional wisdom might say. Um, and we also want to figure out how to reach people who wouldn't otherwise engage with science, you know beyond people who are tuning in for Nova or who would select a science documentary on Netflix. Like, how do you reach those communities and engage with them? And obviously that's like incredibly, you know, we know there's been a crisis of science communication, especially around the pandemic, but of course around other things like climate change and, and, and many other things. But, you know, I think that these questions of reaching audiences and figuring out how to engage with them is just becoming more and more and more vital to, to everything that we do. Um, and, you know, how do we create an engaged network around science communication? So once they see, so once someone sees something or gets interested in science, how do we kind of capture them and keep them engaged? And then, yeah, for research and evaluation, like how do we measure the impact of our work and how can we contribute to the knowledge around science communication? You know, that's just a major goal of ours. 
Um, so I just want to end by thanking uh, the Science Communication Lab team and all of our collaborators. Um, you know, I hope our we hope that we've created a you know a dynamic nonprofit that you know is really trying to experiment in how we create science content and how we evaluate it. Um, there's just people who are who you know have really believe in that mission and have joined us on this journey. And also to the funders who have also kind of taken, you know, been excited about what we're trying to do and given us funding to try to do it. So um, I will end there and I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you all for listening to this talk.